couple of years ago, a lady called Dr. Carol Hull contacted me. She told me she'd read my books and she felt that she could offer some explanations about what might be happening to the people who go missing and why. Dr. Hull is a published poet, artist and PhD in creative arts whose writing has been featured on school curriculum in her native Australia and worldwide. She's had a remarkable life. Her website is carolhull.com, although somebody who had read my book and looked a while ago said that the website was down and maybe back up. She'd contacted me to say that having read my book, she would like to offer me permission to write about her story and her insights into the cases and causes of missing people. She said, in 2003, I became suddenly very ill with chronic fatigue syndrome, which left me bedridden. I was also experiencing recurring spontaneous psychokinesis. I had suspected for a while that the phenomena was coming from an outside source, and a two-way communication was established between them and myself in 2004 through telepathy and channeling. Being into New Age philosophy and a shamanic pagan, I referred to this source as angelic beings and guides, but this MK Ultra was designed and maintained by the dragon. After being saved in 2009, I was to gradually discover I'd been raised and groomed by a spiritual non-human entity. A fallen angel, serpent, part of Satan's hierarchy, who had demons under his command. I refer to him as the dragon. Selected children or chosen ones are repeatedly tested and programmed to ascertain the best way they can be utilised. Unbeknown to me, my purpose became to promote anti-Christian agenda through arts and poetry. This was all controlled and monitored by my spiritual handler. As an infant, I was subjected to MK Ultra monarch programming, including Alpha Beta, Theta, Omega and Marionette doll programming. A number of selves were created to cope with and to potentially fulfil this programming. My situation was different to the Super Soldier programmes, or SRA, since my handlers and minders were interdimensional, non-human entities, fallen angels and demons with the dragon impersonating the spirit of God. At the time, I had no idea I was in communication with the dragon and his demons, but from 1999 to 2009, there are periods of time that I cannot account for fully. The supernatural phenomenon increased during this time, and a number of deaths occurred in my family and several acquaintances. Grief stricken and needing answers, I became increasingly involved in mediumship and the occult. After becoming more involved and immersed in the esoteric world of spirit channeling and mediumship and the occultic arts, the dragon made his presence felt. He began to show me many images of women being abducted or taken by other worldly beings. In the dragon's dimension, or the second heavenlies, he may look like a cherubic serpent or dragon. But in this dimension he was a spirit, a bright orb or a light source, possessing a powerful subconscious in this world, physical. I would see him as a ball of light. Other negative entities would show themselves as cryptids and fake UFOs. She says, when placing my UFO stories online, my phone line was tapped and my website visited over a period of weeks by the government and an investigative agency in DC. My car was swooped on by military helicopters, which also made low swoops over my cottage. People, many children, have gone missing in the national parks around the world under supposed inexplicable circumstances. And she says, it's a known but little publicised fact that the name of Jesus stops all supernatural deception and abductions. The name of Jesus stops all fallen angel attacks, whether it be fake UFO or my lab, shadow men or fairies, Bigfoot or dogman. She said, we're engaged in a spiritual war that is clearly recognised by the enemy. There are rules of engagement. Things the enemy, deadly adversaries, who desire our eternal destruction, are not allowed to do in the name of Jesus. A fallen angel once said to me, soon it will be time to harvest. In order to understand what's happening in these missing cases, 
we need to be aware that the greater reality is a spiritual reality, unseen by human eyes. This list is for the reader to gain a better understanding of the motivations of the supernatural perpetrators in these missing cases. It's their malice towards humans. During a fallen angel attack, your environment may appear different. Hallucinations, holograms, augmented reality, fake, alien, fairy or my lab. A desire to mislead, confuse, disorient, as in getting lost, mind control, altered states of consciousness, false visions, trance states. They have the desire to dominate, control, degrade, humiliate humans and a desire to physically hurt them, cause death, disfigure, maim, mutilate while still alive, like the cattle mutilations, or crushed, burnt, cut, decapitated, dismembered, torn apart. As her list progresses, it becomes clear and obvious how easily these things that appear to happen to those who vanish under inexplicable circumstances in the woods and the forests, and how easily an otherworldly group of perpetrators from the spirit world doing this. The fallen angels, she says, have a desire to lead, lure, chase or herd humans into physical danger. So they will physically perish from dehydration, fatigue, exposure, hypothermia, injury, accident, drowning in a river, sweep or creek, falling off a cliff edge or lookout. The desire to see humans failing represents the original fall of Lucifer and the fallen angels from heaven. The desire to see humans lifted, hanging or suspended represents the spirit being drawn out of the body. Sacrifice, crucifixion. A desire to see humans drowning or drowned goes back to God's flood and a desire for revenge on God and the descendants of Noah after the loss of everything that the fallen angels had created. Fallen angels have neither forgotten nor forgiven God for sending the flood. She continues, a desire to be worshipped as God. This worship requires the person to fall to the ground into a position of subjugation where they're face down. This worship also requires the person to remove their shoes or for their shoes to be removed. Put off your shoes from off your feet for the place wherein you stand is holy ground, God told Moses. There is symbolic meaning as to why most people take off their shoes. In these missing cases, nearly all victims have either one or both shoes missing, along with various articles of clothing. On a practical level, the shoes' coats are removed, so they are more prone to hypothermia, or are less likely to run from their abductor, demonic or Bigfoot, or they may be collected as trophies. The dragon, a fallen angel, once said to me, all you were was a trophy. Fallen angels have utter contempt for human beings who are created in God's image. To lose a shoe from a foot in biblical terms is to shame someone. It also signifies the transfer of property in Jewish culture of the Old Testament. In many missing cases, it's the symbolic transferring of the property from Christ to the fallen angels. And in regard to the human soul and the symbology, it is that the human being is transferring the property of themselves, their souls, to the fallen angel by the removal of the shoe, says Dr. Hull. For those who doubt spiritual existence, perhaps we can more easily believe in seeing angels and being saved by angelic intervention, of stories of people being saved by angels from the woods and cliff edges when they're in mortal danger. But is it too hard to believe that if these stories are true, of angelic intervention, then couldn't it also be that the stories of being harmed by the counterpart are also true? If we find ourselves calling out to God or Jesus or an angel in personal moments of terror or danger or despair, then surely so too could we bring ourselves to believe that if they exist, so too do their enemies, the fallen ones. Dr. Hull's list of the intervention of spiritual entities Wanting humans to suffer, be lost, be mutilated, fall off cliffs, drown, take trophies from them, like interdimensional serial killers. For they cannot have what we have, physical bodies and free determination. So in the wish to degrade those they envy, the human, to see them frightened, lost, helpless, 
broken. So Dr. Hull's thesis would seem to make a lot of good points. Is it possible that these people that go missing in the forests and the woods are allowed to become prey or sacrifices to the fallen ones? Many people over the years have contacted me to relate their awful fear upon seeing horrifying entities in the woods that never fully show themselves. Could they be fallen angels, not fully manifested? Take the case of Makaya, who was walking the dog with her dad in the woods when they noticed something among the trees. She said, if you've ever seen Predator, you know how he can appear clear sometimes. This thing was clear like that, except it was human-shaped. I know it wasn't a hallucination, since it made the brush shake. Couldn't have been an illusion. And my dad shined a flashlight at it and it turned and looked at us. My heart was pounding. We kept on walking and didn't say anything for about ten seconds and then we both said at the same time, Did you see that? My heart was beating. I was panicking. The thing actually interacted with the physical world when it hit a branch and the branch shook. It was camouflaged but you could see an outline and it was moving and it was not a trick of the eye. Trick of the eye doesn't leave physical markers. A lady called Arnica says, I really don't know what to call it, yet my boyfriend and I were camping in 2008, just sitting around the lake and talking, and I looked into the woods and it was there, sitting against a tree, legs stretched and crossed, just watching us. I was scared to death, so just ignored it, and then when I looked back, it was gone. It did not care that I saw it. It was just there watching. It had camo all over its skin, and it blended in right in front of you. In 2014, Greg from North Carolina called into a radio show to tell of his unsettling experience in Tennessee in 94. He said, I was living in Nashville. I don't do drugs or drink. It was about three in the afternoon. I was out walking the dog, and I could feel something watching me. I started looking directly at the woods in front of me, and I couldn't see anything but I could hear leaves rustling in the trees. So I started looking up toward the top of the trees. I had very good eyesight at the time. I saw something crouched down in the treetops. The only way I could describe it, and I don't even know if the movie had yet come out, but was Predator, where they saw that invisible creature, yet you could see the outline of everything, but you could see right through it, and it was sitting up in the very top of the trees where it wouldn't hold the weight of a man by any means. This thing was as big as a man. I just stood there looking at it and then I let go of the dog and I took off at a dead run toward this thing. It started running across the tops of the trees. It ran the length of the football field in no time. I don't know how it was running across the tops of the trees, but I know what I saw. What in the world are you doing chasing this thing? I stopped and it stopped about the length of the football field away from where it was and it turned around and looked at me. I never told anybody because people will think I'm crazy. A rather sinister article appeared back in July 1992 in a journal called The Phoenix Liberator. It says a researcher L. Savage. Back in 1999, several accounts suggest that the military-industrial complex entered into a collaboration with a parasitical alien race. In exchange for advanced technology, the industrialists allowed the aliens to access the trillion-dollar military-industrial underground network to carry out genetic experiments. Those who received the new Trojan horse techno also received major mind-control programming. And as a result, the underground networks are assimilated by the alien collective by effectively controlling the minds of those people who pose the greatest threat to alien imperialism, those with the access to the technology. There are reportedly cloned humans with cybernetic minds and reptilian DNA who work in these facilities. They are known as the Orange because of their stalk-like yellowish-reddish hair along with greys, reptiloids, military black ops and others. These aliens create a facade of benevolence towards the programmed humans who work in the underground facilities. Reports of abductions and dissections of humans abound. 
reportedly, with the purpose of finding our weaknesses and learning how to control us. At Teha Chappi in Arizona, there are open silos where hovering basketball-sized drones or spy bees monitor all activity above and below ground, where ground scrapers descend at least two miles and 42 sublevels connecting to other facilities via tunnels and to more ancient alien cavern domains, both natural and artificial. The site is supposedly located off Little Oak Canyon, northwest of Lancaster. These aliens have been known to abduct or even kill someone, who have reported their presence there, because the aliens operate inside our government via the Military Industrial Trojan Horse, which operates outside of Congress oversight and do not want their subversive activities to be discovered by the masses. Just west of Ottawa, the article continues, is allegedly the location of an alien project centre, huge facilities, an alien collective, infiltrated the military government complex via sellout industrialists. But in making deals, they have succeeded only in being drawn deeper into their occult technological control. The tech and intellect of the aliens combined with their mastery of sorcery and supernatural warfare has made battle futile, except for those who have succeeded in acquiring the supernatural power directly from the creator necessary to meet and defeat the aliens in the supernatural realm. And in turn, the collective, which is incarnated and organised by Luciferian entities behind the scenes. In this war, the chaplain is of equal, if not greater value than the general, as the aliens attack humankind via technological sorcery. These places are the most deserted places on earth. Many have been known to go to these places and never come back, or if they do, they are never the same. Meanwhile, in Scotland, the Harperig Reservoir lies to the far west of the Pentland Hills Regional Park, a stunning range of hills in the Scottish borders that stretch from the city of Edinburgh down to the small village of Carlops. It's a mixture of private land used for farming and sport shooting and publicly owned land. The reservoir itself lies along the A70 road west of Bellano at the foot of the Cold Stain Slap, the pass between West Carn and East Carn Hills. There's an old castle at the reservoir called Cairn Castle, built around 1440. It's a ruin keep, a keep being a fortified tower. All that's left of it is a tower and a small square wing. It stands on a raised mound jutting out into the reservoir, which is filled by the water of the River Leith. The reservoir sits to the far west of the Pentland Regional Park. On the east side sits the famous Rosalind Chapel, as featured in the Dan Brown novel The Da Vinci Code. The chapel has been the subject of speculative theories concerning the connection with the Knights Templar, the Freemasons and the Holy Grail. But it was at this reservoir that, according to the Scotsman newspaper, UFO abduction claims sparked secret military probe. They say rather than being dismissed at the time as Hollywood fantasy, the 1992 incident was taken seriously enough to be investigated by the Ministry of Defence. On August 17th, 1992, 33-year-old ambulance technician Gary Wood, who lived in Edinburgh, was driving to Tarbrax in the South Lanarkshire area, accompanied by Colin Wright, aged 25. They were off to deliver a satellite TV to their friend. It was around 10pm and they were driving along the A70 and as they passed the reservoir, suddenly Colin exclaimed, What the hell is that? as he pointed upward into the night sky. Above them was a two-tiered, disc-shaped black object, approximately 20 feet above the front of their car. It came into view as they rounded a corner. It had been partially hidden by the trees. It was shiny metallic. It had no windows. Gary hit the accelerator pedal in an attempt to accelerate away from the object. In fact, as Colin would later say, Gary drove like a madman. As they drove, the object above them beamed down a bright light, and what happened next is pretty horrific. 
The encounter they had was later revealed in declassified MOD, Ministry of Defence documents, released in 2012. A two-page report on what became known as the A-70 incident was sent to the MOD's UFO desk. The document had the heading, Unexplained Aerial Sighting. Colin and Gary said that they experienced a complete blackout of lights as absolute darkness set in around them. In fact, the blackness made Gary think he'd crushed the car and they were dead. He came to the realisation, however, that the car was still moving at an alarming speed. And they seemed to be going in the opposite direction now, yet they had no memory of actually turning the car around. Their seatbelts were also hanging off, and they were both trembling violently. The black object above them had disappeared, and they somehow managed to calm down enough to make their way to the destination, to their friend's house. When they arrived, it should have been about 40 minutes later, according to the time it usually took them, and the distance from where they were, but they were stunned to discover that when their friend called out from his bedroom window, angrily asking what the heck they were doing knocking on his door, it wasn't 10.45pm, the time they'd believed it was, it was well after 1am. The official classified documents about the incident demonstrates that the Ministry of Defence took the account somewhat seriously, given that they classified the report. It states that Gary was driving, quote, when the object dropped a curtain of white light in front of the car. His friend blacked out for what seemed like 10, 15 seconds. He thought he had died. When he woke up, the car was facing the opposite direction on the wrong side of the road. When he checked his watch, he'd lost about one hour. The object in the report is described as 20 feet in height and 30 feet across, black in colour with no lights at all. Gary and Colin reported the incident to the police, a doctor, a psychologist and a university professor. Four years after the incident, Gary said, I saw three creatures coming towards my car. I felt immense pain, like an electric shock. Then I was in some room. I saw these things like we men, little men, moving about, doing something to me. Then this six-foot creature approached. It was grey-white in colour, with a large head and a long, slender neck, very slim shoulders and waist dark eyes. The arms were like ours, but there were four very long fingers. The little ones were about three feet tall and seemed to do all the work, while the big ones did the communication. Apparently they said to him, Sanctuary, we are here already and we are coming here. Gary said that a red-hot poker object was put into his eye and he was surrounded by other crying humans. In the days that passed after the incident, both men were exhausted. They felt completely drained of all energy. And yet, they found it impossible to sleep. And when they eventually did manage to sleep, both of them had the most dreadful nightmares, and they would wake with pounding heads. Their nightmares were extremely graphic, vivid and disturbing. When Gary, the mechanic, went to the doctors for help, he was referred to the hospital to have an MRI scan and a spinal tap. Neither procedure found any anomalies or problems. On the advice of the British UFO Association, Colin and Gary underwent hypnotic regression in an effort to reveal what had really happened to them during that night in their period of missing time. In the first session, Gary found himself bursting into tears. He was unable to be consoled. He and his friend both recalled memories of sitting in the car when three humanoid creatures approached the car and opened the doors. Gary was taken out of the car by the humanoids and laying on a stretcher, according to Colin. Gary said, I saw three creatures coming towards the car. I felt intense pain like an electric shock. Then I was in a room and I saw these things, like men, moving around, doing something to me. Then a six-foot creature approached me. Colin remembered being taken through a corridor that was circular. When he reached the end of the corridor, one of the creatures took him inside a room that had no features inside it. It was a bare room, and the creatures stripped his clothes from him, and an examination began. 
he recalls being naked standing inside a glass container with his ankles tied together. From his vantage point inside the glass container, he could see other men and women, also naked, also standing inside glass containers. The room was hazy, as though some kind of smoke or fog was in it, and he also saw something that seemed to be a scanning device. He believed it was scanning the humans in the glass containers, including him. Colin said he found himself lying prone on a table, but he couldn't move, even though he didn't think he was tied to the table. Both he and Gary stated that while they were held inside the rooms, they could hear screams of agony coming from the other humans. Colin confirmed the same descriptions of small humanoid creatures as well as much taller, skinnier ones. Both men said there was one specific tall creature who seemed to be in charge. Gary referred to him as the Emperor. Gary asked him what he wanted. Sanctuary, came the reply. During their regression sessions, both men wept openly and often. Gary also took a lie detector test under the supervision of Professor Susan Greenwood for a BBC programme. He passed the test. According to Brian Allen of SPI Strange Phenomena Investigations, Colin was regressed by therapist Helen Waters. In his regression session, he says, I'm cold. I'm getting carried along. Something's looking back at me in the corridor. It's ugly and it's lurking in that corridor. It seems ancient. It's badly deformed. I think it's trying to manipulate me. I can hear a noise behind me. I'm staring at a wee creature. It's not very happy with me. I don't think I was supposed to look behind my chair. It's looking back at me with those black eyes. If I try to do anything, they'll come round the corner and stop me. Two of them have got me by the feet and are dragging me towards a small archway. They're not fussy about hurting me. There's a big alien in front of me doing something or taking something out of my head. It's shooting pain. My brain feels like it's swollen. Like it's going to burst. I can't handle this. From the archives of Charles Fort, the Great Fortean, comes Lloyd's Weekly News of London on January the 17th, 1909. A story from the Caucasian city of Baku. Mr. Krasilukov and two companions had gone on a hunting trip to Sand Island in the Caspian Sea. Nothing had been heard from them, and there was an investigation. The searchers came upon the bodies of the three men, lying in positions that indicated that they had died without a struggle. No marks of injuries, no disarrangement of clothes. At the autopsy, no trace of poison was found. The doctors, though they wouldn't commit themselves to an explanation, thought the men had stifled. Then there is the Observer account as well, from August the 23rd, 1925. A mysterious tragedy is reported from the Polish Tatra Mountains near the health resort of Zokopane. A party, composed of Mr. Kaznicka, the judge of the Supreme Court, his wife, a 12-year-old son, and a young student of Krakow University, started out in fine weather for a short excursion in the neighbouring mountains. Two days later, three of them were found dead. Mrs. Kaznicka was alive. She told that all were climbing and were in good condition when suffocation came upon them. A stifling wind, she thought. One after another, they had dropped unconscious. The post-mortem examinations revealed nothing that indicated deaths by suffocation, nor anything else that could be definitively settled upon. So far, the case remains a mystery, the newspaper said. 